I should then, why don't I see it on my, oh, I need to. Good morning. Uh, welcome to NetConf Working Group uh, meeting for ITF 117. If this is not the working group you were looking for, this would be a good time to exit. All right. Uh, thank you and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to folks online. Um, let's get started. Uh, next slide. Or, or did you... All right. This is the note well uh, for the for ITF. Please make sure you're following all the best current practices that are documented on the slide and on the web. Uh, basically, by participating in this meeting and online on the mailing list, you agree to follow the ITF processes and policies. And if you're not aware, uh, do go to these BCPs uh, that are listed below. Next slide. Um, we do follow a code of conduct uh, at ITF. Uh, we rely on a mutual respect and cooperation between participants. Um, and if we need to, the chairs will intervene uh, to enforce these guidelines. Next slide. Uh, nothing that you should not be already familiar with, but just for folks who are new to ITF or, and this working group, we are following the meeting in Meet Echo. Uh, obviously, you're here, so you know that. You should be logged into Meet Echo. Um, at this point, and make sure that um, if you haven't, uh, Kent is walking by using the scanning tool. Use that to log in to make sure these are your, our virtual blue sheets with, that are used to track attendance. There is a chat now. Uh, there's a chat window that you can make as, as a separate window for people. Uh, for to carry on the conversation, um, and also a Zulip link that you can use uh, to provide comments. Uh, we do have a two-hour slot um, with plenty of time to uh, for discussion, and I don't think so. We will need a countdown timer, but uh, um, we do, of course, have to finish in two hours. Uh, please do use the queue mechanism in Meet Echo to. Um, get on the mic and to cue, use the icon with the hand symbol to speak. Uh, make sure that you've unmuted your um, microphone. And of course, remember to remove yourself from the queue. Uh, we'll do that, of course, if we still see someone lingering. There is a notes page uh, that uh, we have. Would appreciate people contributing to that note section for the meeting. Um, right click and make it a separate tab if you don't want to be stuck just taking notes. Um, next slide. Okay, so where are we with the chartered work group items? Uh, HTTP note of draft is still in IESG review. Uh, the authors are working with the area director to clear some of the items that were brought up as part of the review. The client server suite of drafts is working through 80 uh, review and comments. And I can't, the author here is working through providing or fixing some of those, uh, addressing some of those comments. The TLS 1.3 uh, draft is in Shepherd review. And the rest of the drafts are work in progress, some of them being discussed in this meeting. The first three 
the final the list pagination draft is something um, that is not on this meeting agenda anything you wanted to add for client server uh, i mean specifically the client server suite drafts um i think there's one outstanding issue that we might warrant discussion we don't have a, an item on the agenda to discuss it so would now be an appropriate time to discuss it or Uh, so, Rob Wilson, Cisco. Um, yes, I mean, I'm still slightly behind with your latest comments. I haven't, <laughs> uh, I haven't read those. But in terms of discussion we had today, uh, the two aspects we we discussed was about effectively, um, if you have uh, either mandatory set on particular fields or requirements that's true on the leaf refs, then you either optimize the solution for the case of where it's either set in the running data store or if you have a system data store now. Um, we have that system data store draft in, in NetMod, that's sort of progressive, but we don't quite know where that solution is going to end up with. And the one thing I do not want to do is to in any way block these drafts on the outcome of that solution. I, I want to get them finished. So um, I think the one question I had really was, I agreed with you that taking the mandatory off, uh, sorry, keeping the mandatory on nodes was the right answer. And requiring it's maybe is exactly the same concern, but that was the one I think that came up in other discussions I had. So. I don't know if anyone in this room has any opinions on that um, or understands the question well enough to what I'm saying. So, uh, Kent, as a contributor, I, I think this dovetails with the with system discussion of uh, if running must be validatable. So the mandatory true, if you're trying to validate running document in isolation, then it would fail. But if you're merging with system where, in fact, those leaves are defined, then intended would be valid from the perspective of those leaves existing and the mandatory would succeed. Yes. So I think, I don't know if anyone has any views in the room. I can't see anyone coming up to the mic. No. So, um, so I'll follow up on the list on that and see if there's any other comments on there. And then if, if there's not, I think we'll still proceed with, with this in a way, whichever way is most flexible to change it in the future if we need to. Okay. And to the feedback to the room, I'm still replying to Rob's 80 comments. Um, I only stopped, I stopped at SSH, I still have TLS, HTTP, NetConf, and RESTConf to reply to. All right, uh, thanks for that update. So here's the agenda for the meeting. Um, we have uh, about four items on the chartered list. We do have one, a combination of uh, non-chartered items at the bottom, which will uh, flow into the non-chartered item list, um, but um, that's what it is. Um, next slide. Okay, and that's the final slide of the list of non-chartered items on the agenda. Okay, with that, we should be able to move to the next first presentation. Alex. Um, so hello, I am um, hello, I am Alex uh, from Inselion on behalf of the authors, and we wanted to uh, give an update to the working group on UDP notice draft. Okay, I'm not sure if it works. Oh, no. Or okay. Um, so since the last ATF, uh, no big changes on the draft. We have published a dash 10 uh, iteration of the draft, uh, addressing some of the feedback uh, from uh, Maesh and Kent on the generic UDP client grouping. We added uh, implementation status of uh, this draft and did some editorial changes. And the authors would like to uh, request more feedback on, and comments uh, through the mic or, or through, the, through a mailing list. Oh. Yes. Kent is a contributor. And actually, I thought uh, I'll just echo what I thought Mahesh had written to the list already. But um, I think the uh, request is to create a standalone UDP client server. Draft. There is a slide for that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so. 
uh, we have uh, implemented it at, in the same draft, the IETF UDP client, a generic grouping for UDP clients. And we were asked also if uh, there were plans to implement the UDP server grouping. Um, the authors believe this uh, UDP server, it not, does not make sense to implement it in the same draft since it is not used, but it is used for, for NetConf. And, and therefore we would like uh, more feedback, opinions, what should, uh, how should we implement uh, all this basically. Right, so uh, one is the question, yes. So yes to the fact that it probably it's good to have both a client and a server grouping. Um, keeping in mind that, you know, we have quick, that is also uh, something that they're planning to use for NetConf future. We don't know as yet, but something good to have. Um, same for DTLS container. Uh, it would be helpful to keep it separate from the server client grouping. And if Kent is a contributor to add to that, um, not only do I think UDP server is a good idea to have, and, and if you think about my own work with the client server suite of drafts, it started off with just wanting to have a NetConf server. The, and then people, oh, you have to do the client also. And then oh, it can't be just NetConf, it needs RESTConf. And it just went on and on. I, I mean, the, it was uh, a difficult effort. I mean, it was a lot of work, but the result is great and it's being used throughout the ITF now. I think the same is true here. So this is the opportunity to create both the client and the server, even though your work only needs the client. Um, I'd even take it a step further in suggesting that it should be isolated to its own document. And so there'd be one document called the UDP client server document, and then another, which is the work, and it would import or use that document. So. Okay, and would you be open to work together on, on that? Uh, yeah, okay. sure. Uh, Rob Walton, Cisco. Yeah, I, I to echo Kent's suggestions. It sounds like a good idea to me. Um, the one thing I would say, and also to Mahesh's point, I think actually reaching out to the uh, quick folks at the same time saying, we're doing this, are you interested? Uh, I think is a good idea. My slight concern is that's thing going to slow everything down again. But, uh, but I do think trying to generalize this out it would be a good idea. Yeah, I totally agree with you. The, my only concern was slowing down the process of the draft, but I'm okay with that. But there, there's still an option of um, splitting these out to a separate draft as a starting point, um, do the client server stuff and say, say to Quick, look, this, will this work for you from, the, from a starting point? If you want to come along and write stuff quickly, we can do that. Uh, otherwise, we can bis that, that document in the future and let this one still. So, so I, I think you can still try and get a middle ground, I hope of getting some of this stuff, move your stuff forward, but still make it general enough that we can extend it well in the future. This makes sense. Next slide. So if there is no feedback, I think that's the end, yeah. Um, so here, the same Alex Wang from Insaleon on behalf of the authors presenting an update on the distributed native draft. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, so since the last IETF, we just published a new iteration, uh, adding implementation status and some editorial changes. And we got uh, feedback about the observation domain ID that it's a bit confusing for the developers. Uh, because the same term is used in IPFIX. And uh, the authors uh, will rework this term in the next iterations. And uh, like the last draft, we are requesting more feedback on, and comments on, on the distributed native. Next. Um, that, yeah, that's it. Okay. Any comments? No comments? All right, thank you. Thanks.
Uh, hello, everybody, on behalf of the authors. Uh, some updates on the versioning in the Yang notification subscription. Next slide, please. So the, the document was adopted in NetConf with the 03 version. Uh, we got during the adoption call some updates from Andy Biermann regarding that uh, one uh, XPath can actually refer to multiple Yang models uh, and also some inconsistency between section two and uh, section 4.1. Uh, both of them were addressed in the latest revision and also uh, some uh, comments on uh, where the additional uh, leaf is being augmented, which I'm describing in the, in the next slide. Next slide, please. So this is currently the, uh, the, 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 the Yang model which we are describing and then at the bottom also the, an example on the uh, subs uh, on the subscribe notification message itself. That's all. Did you want to walk us through the change? Uh, sure. So uh, in so basically on the augments itself, uh, we are now on the augmenting essence stream and IP data store. Uh, there we are having uh, in addition to revision and revision label, we are adding now also module name. Okay. Alex. Um, so Alex Wang in Salion, uh, co-authoring this draft. The main changes on this draft were uh, addressing the X path that could uh, be linked to multiple modules, and therefore we are changing the revi the module revision label and revi and revision into same grouping, but instead of only one, doing it by a list. Exactly. Thanks, Alex. Kent is a contributor. I'm just wondering to what extent you've uh, interacted with the original authors of the Yang push drafts. And are they, you know, are, are they familiar with this work? Are they supportive of this work? Um, so uh, basically everything was over the, the, the mailing list mm -hmm. during the, the adoption call. And also we had in the last ITF, uh, we had some discussions in the room. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I mean, they are they interact as in strong support, or do you remember? Yeah, uh, this is uh, what they commented. Okay. I haven't gotten any feedback on the mailing list. Okay. Okay, too far from Huawei. I, I read through this document. I think it might need some error handling. What if the client choose a, a module revision that the server do not support, that doesn't support it? I think, what if will the server return an error or a failed subscription result will return. I think it might not handle on that. If I understood you correctly, are you asking if the, uh, so are you referring to the notification message or do, uh, in the subscription if the server is not supporting? Yeah, d during the subscription, the client subscribe and specify a uh, module name and revision, but the server doesn't support that revision. So, so we are supporting uh, the, the, the current way of subscribing. So this is optional. So you can subscribe either to a specific uh, revision mm -hmm. or you can subscribe to a, a, a revision la a label or a, you can describe it needs to be uh, backward compatible to a specific re revision label. Uh, yeah, but my, my question is, what if the client specify the revision that the server does not support it? Will the server I, return an error? Uh, I see. So that, that we need to add on the draft, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And I think the comment is more general in saying that she, what she was referring to is any error handling. Exactly. So yeah, this is Alex Clem. Just wanted to respond to Kent as one of the authors of uh, 86, 41, and 39. I, okay, I, I need to review this and I will respond uh, on the list as well. I'll, I'll engage on this. Excellent. Thanks, Alex.
Uh, so Rob Wilson, Cisco, uh, as a participant. So I, I think this is great. Uh, in terms of adding this in, it's all fine. Uh, one thought is we've had some discussion by email about Yang packages as an alternative way to, to describe the schema. I'm not ready to latest draft, and I'm not saying that I think we had some discussion about it's probably not ready to include direct references to it, but knowing what the answer would be for Yang packages would be interesting. Would that just be uh, extra augmented fields to give it like a Yang package? schema reference instead of or in addition to this or would it be would it be wise to make this a choice statement to give that a choice between which you return so the clarity i think or some thought about whether you would be expected to return both the module lists and also yang packages reference we could do one or the either might be an interesting thought I, that that's definitely an, an interesting question uh what would be interesting also for me as an author is would you like to have it in the subscription itself that you can choose the package? Uh, should that be an option? Or do you think uh, it should be only on the subscribe state change notification messages where we are describing basically to which package that young model belongs to? So I think when you make the subscription, that would also be useful to basically say, I'm um, to subscribe and use this um, this package, or maybe it might, again, it might be a set of packages as the reference, because I see the aim of the Yang packages is that becomes like an alternative to Yang library or extra metadata, and that becomes this defines the scheme of the device. Yeah. And hence, if you want to lock your subscription down to, I'm making sure the device is using the same schema I'm expecting, that would be the really good reference to put in your subscription that binds it. And then back to Shafeng's point, you would then fail the subscription if it differs and give it an explanation. Right, and if I understood correctly, it would be in the subscription that instead of actually uh, selecting a certain revision or revision label, it would be then just the package and with that itself, basically, you're Yeah, you're the, the, the package and the package revision or revision label. Exactly. Yes. Mm -hmm. Good, thanks. So Benoit, it took me some time to find a button, sorry. So Rob, uh, what is the action for this draft, right? Is this to think about how we could augment in the future? Is this enough or we have to wait for the package because of the, it's, it's like, you know, uh, a long time, right? Uh, yes, I'm definitely saying don't delay this draft for packages. That's not my intent. It's just to think about and maybe have some text to say, this is how we think this would fit in and make sure that there's an answer. Hey, Jan, I'd pass slide control to you. Thank you. So uh, I and uh, Jan Imblad and uh, Rocky Gagliano, my colleague, would like to talk about transaction ID and the related trace. So I'll start with the transaction ID developments. And control actually works great. So the latest version now is draft ITF net from transaction ID 01. There was, uh, uh, this was adopted in the last uh, meeting. So the uh, major changes here is that uh, when the implementation team started working on this on our side, uh, we noticed a few things that were not uh, quite optimal. So we changed the way that Yang push was mapped uh, with the transaction ID so that instead of relying on external attributes, uh, we have separate leaves in the Yang push header that convey transaction ID information because then Yang push updates over REST conf would also work without any sort of special attribute handling or something. And similarly, uh, we got some really good feedback uh, from uh, James Cumming at Nokia, uh, suggesting one of the things he suggested was to add support for transaction ID in data store comparison, that's RC9144. So we added that and did it similarly so that it doesn't depend on XML attributes. And also many other clarifications and questions are thanks to James. Thank you. Uh, the implementation team also found some errors in our examples, so uh, they have been fixed too. Uh, 
And one of the things this uh, implementation team suggested was that uh, we can actually make this mechanism even more lean so that less redundant information is returned if we can assume that the server knows a little bit, uh, remembers a little bit more about transaction IDs in, from the past. So by keeping a history, we can know more about what the client knows and make sure that we only send the few things that are really relevant. So there are some potential future, further savings to do in this mechanism that is trying to reduce the amount of traffic we send to clients that already have some sort of sync. It adds a little bit uh, of complexity to the server implementations. Um, but what I think may be more contentious here is that this is beyond what uh, the REST conf solution 8040 uh, provides today. So uh, the, there's a question I'll ask the chairs for a poll about this in a minute. Another thing that uh, the, the implementation team came up with was that uh, you, you, when you do a get and getting transaction IDs and various nodes in the data tree, in the config tree, uh, you will notice there which nodes a particular server considers uh, had, it is tracking uh, transaction IDs for. But you can't see this from the Yang mob itself only. So if you're offline or trying to develop towards a device that you don't have access to right now, you don't know where those transaction IDs are going to sit. So they suggested, what about we add an extension for that so that we can, we allow people to mark here is going to be a transaction ID on this node here and this other node here. So that's an interesting open possibility for us to add. Uh, the implementation team is all, also asking if we shouldn't be using defining and using metadata with Yang, that's RFC 7952. And that's actually something that was considered early on by me. Uh, but I think that the behavior in that draft is not, it's not consistent with, with uh, RFC 8040 REST comp specifies for the REST comp behavior. So that's why I decided not to use that because it would be confusing to have uh, even if we write this does not apply to REST console, so on, so on it, it would be confusing. So I decided to not depend on that at all. So uh, just to explain this uh, savings a little bit in a little bit more detail here, let's say that we have a configuration tree uh, with a few nodes, and uh, some of those nodes have a transaction ID uh, associated with them. That's the one with small dots around there. And then the client comes in and changes a node at the bottom, and then the transaction ID trickles up all the way to the top. Uh, and then on the next slide, I'll show you what happens with some different mechanisms. So we, in this document, we describe something called the last modified transaction ID mechanism. And we have the E tag transaction ID mechanism. And what is now proposed by the development team was uh, this E tag plus memory of the sequence transaction ID mechanism something like that, E tag plus set. We're remembering which sequence the various transaction IDs have been uh, executed on the server. Then if we have a client with no transaction ID support at all, that's the client zero on the left here. You have the data tree uh, being like this. Somebody updates, uh, as we saw on the previous slide, uh, uh, one of the elements, the middle element on the bottom, and that trickles all the way up. So if you do a sort of get config uh, with transaction ID awareness at the bottom, uh, or in, in this client zero case, there's no transaction ID at all, you get the whole subtree, changed nodes and unchanged node alike. With the e tag mechanism, uh, you would, as a client, specify the transaction ID for a few nodes that you know about as a client say, hey, I know the transaction ID of the top node and these two left and right nodes. And then the server would reply with the nodes that have been changed or that you don't know anything about. So then you get the three yellow changed ones and you will get one bonus unchanged element because you didn't, the server, the, sorry, the client didn't speak about the transaction ID on the lowest node there. So it, the server couldn't know if you knew that or not. In the the REST conf e tag case, the only thing you can communicate the transaction ID for in REST conf is the top node. So there's no way to do anything else in REST conf. It's a limitation of the REST conf well, transaction ID or whatever mechanism that you have there. You can only do that as a header 
in the message, which means you can only speak about the top level. So you can only specify the top level node. Since the top level node has changed transaction ID, when you do a get conf over rest conf or a get over rest conf, you will get the whole salt tree anyway. So the savings is not so great in this particular case here. Uh, and uh, in the third case, this, this, is, this is what the development team was proposing here that, okay, let's say that we keep a history at the server. So we know all the, the sequence of all the transaction IDs that have been, and the uh, client is, is supplying the latest transaction ID that he knows. We will know that he already knows the rightmost down bottom node. So we can return only the actual exact nodes that have been changed. So that's minimizing the communication even a bit more. But this is something that is not possible over RESTConf really. So it's only for NetConf. And my question to you now is, uh, oh, this, this check mark implementation experience, uh, this question mark, there should be a check mark. Uh, but my question to you, and I would, I would hope that the chairs can bring out the poll is uh, if we should try to define this additional mechanism that's even more conservative when it comes to communication on then deviating or adding to things that are not available in RESTConf, or if it's better that we stay true to exactly the same functionality as in RESTConf. I don't know what the room thinks. So Kent is a contributor. Um, I know you spent a few slides there trying to describe this new mechanism, but I feel like I don't understand <laughs> it completely still. <laughs> the, uh, so do I understand the proposal to be that the server would then be stateful, that it would have to remember the history of the request from the client? Not from a particular client, but it would have to remember the history of all transactions for a bit. The more, the better, uh, the more savings can be done. If, it's an inf if it keeps a, a, a record of the last 100 transactions, uh, then for most purposes, you, you would be able to give all clients an exact list. These nodes have changed since you last did the check. And okay, so the, it the, ser the server has a history of the transactions and then in the client's request, it, um, it, it provides the last transaction it was aware of? Yes, exactly. And then the server is able to, to deliver the diff towards that uh, transaction because all the nodes are marked with a transaction ID. So you can deliver all the ones that are newer than that one. I see. And then just the final point is that the ability for the client to specify the last transaction it was aware of is possible in NetConf, but not so much in RESTConf. Yeah, I mean, if you look at RFC uh, 8040, uh, that mechanism is not there. So we could define this for RefConf also, but the current definition that exists in 8040 does not include this. Is it actually 8040 or is it the uh, HTTP specification that 8040 depends on? Uh, no, I mean, you would, you would need to have some text in 8040 for this to work. And it's not there now. We could add that also if, if, if so. But so far, I've tried to make sure that we get more function or better uh, functionality in NetConf than RESTConf, but it should be really easy to do both at the same time. It's very compatible, but this would go one step beyond that. But maybe it's actually worthwhile to do this also for RESTConf. But the question is really, do we want to stay, to, uh, stay, stay true to, Net, to RESTConf as much as possible, or can we, add more functionality for rest for netconf that makes it uh, even more saving or more efficient okay i suppose that could be a poll question as well i see rob is in the queue so uh, rob watson so it's like a clarifying question as a participant is the and i don't really understand the mechanism exactly is the e tag plus sequence an optimization so you said if you store more history you can give a more accurate answer so my question is is it possible that um, you can have you have servers that support e tag plus sequence, and it gives you the more they they store the like the reduced set of information it returns you, but if they store less, it might still give you effectively the answer of client one if, it, if it's like outside the history. So could exactly. you have a solution? So so you could effectively say uh, if you were to support e tag plus sequence, that sequence is effectively like an optional thing, and a, a you could generate that to saying I have a sequence length of zero and hence I effectively fall down to the case of client one. Exactly like that. Okay, thank you.
we're preparing a show of hands poll. Uh, how about we start off? Should um, restaurant support be the same? Um, Jan, we're trying to come up with a decision tree of the various poll <laughs> questions. No, but it's just one question. It's whether we should stay true to RestConf or we should have something that's more efficient. That's the only one. Okay, we'll stick with that. So again, as a, as a participant, originally when you were first presenting this, I was thinking, oh, you're adding too much complexity in here and driving to, to a, a more complex solution. But given it's entirely optional to implement, then as long as a client might try being return secret numbers and might get, I don't even return an error if you can't return it. Um, or you uh, or you can just return less data. Actually, it seems like a, just an optional enhancement effectively that could be implemented, in which case that sounds reasonable to me. Yes, I mean, that's exactly the thing. Do we want things to be very similar in RESTConf and NETCONF or do we want this added efficiency that we can have? Okay, just about ready. Oh, Rashad? Rashad, you're in queue. Did you want to say something while people are filling out the poll? Sorry for the delay. I was the poll was distracting me. Um, just in one of the previous slides, Jan, I think you said one of the next steps is to tag individual nodes with an extension to show whether they're being versioned, and that's right. part of the optimization. This is an orthogonal question. It's just if you want to mark in Yang which nodes in your implementation uh, that will have this or not. Okay, I'm having audio issues on my side. I'll sync up. All right, okay, thanks. Okay, so not too much change in the poll now, so we can go ahead and close it. Uh, so overwhelming uh, yes to uh, allowing variants for support of rest comp, I guess. Majority. Yeah. Very good, thank you. Uh, this just tells me that it's worthwhile to go ahead and try to specify a mechanism. We will have a second chance to say yes or no to the actual result in the end. Uh, that's not the problem, but this is good enough support for me to think I should spend some time on it. That, that's all I wanted, thank you. And for the next steps here, okay, so, uh, I'm also interested in people, if we want to make comments about uh, having this extension in the Yang tree to mark this or not, if you want to say that on the list or right here in the room, that's that's interesting too, if we should do, but it's probably easy to define. And uh, our well, next step after that is uh, further implementation experience. Uh, so Rob Wilson, Cisco adds participant. So yes, I wanted to comment on the Yang extension because um, that, that might be helpful, I don't know. But don't you have the limitation effectively in Yang by being extension? You can only add it to modules that you are also defining. And hence, whereas this is an example where of you actually probably want to add the extension onto an existing Yang module. And so there's that piece of work that we've talked about many times and might be interesting to find is, is like a Yang annotate extension that allows you to modify existing nodes. I know you have an implementation of doing something for that. For TLF, uh, and so, and I know that we have an implementation for doing that for other places. It might be a time that which we, we got together and to find one standard way of doing this. So that'd be quite helpful. And I think this is the node tags work. That's a net. Model. Yes, I think that exists already. Okay. Well, <clears throat> uh, I don't fully understand Rob's comment because it's possible to add a. Uh, extension with a deviation. So you can push it into, I don't know, an IETF model if Ericsson or whoever wants to implement it that way. The other thing, I think this extension is rather important. We sometimes have unbalanced trees where one side is very big and others is small. And they're knowing that I can version them or check the transaction ID separately is very important. 
and Kent as a contributor, I'd also uh, like to offer support for the extension. Thank you. I think we can move over to Trace. Rocky, it's yours. No, no, don't. There's a few more slides in this one, so don't take it away. Sorry. I'll try to bring back. Do you have it back? It looks back to me. Um, hello, hi, this is Roque, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, okay, so I, I'm gonna be talking about the next two drafts. These are, as we were mentioned, was still individual contribution draft. And uh, one of the key things that you'll see here is that we're talking about two drafts this time and not one. That's because we submitted the version 00, zero of the RESCOM sibling for the NetConf uh, draft, both of them touching the same extension for um, for trace context. Correct. So, I'll do next, next. Okay. So the changes that you see from uh, in the case of the NetConf draft from the, the previous version to this zero uh, three version. First, we completed the error handling and uh, uh, we defined an SX uh, structure with an example. We also receive, uh, we improved the introduction per the feedback we had in the last IETF regarding uh, the idea of adding uh, comments on how all the different uh, drafts in this area work together. And finally, we did receive initial feedback from Ayana on the submissions we were going to be doing. We also incorporated that. Regarding the RESCONF draft, uh, it's it's a new draft. We were just, uh, you know, but it's the same concepts and uh, one of the key things is that it's much simpler because in the case of RESCONF, we are basically requesting the adoption of the W3C, the W3C uh, headers already defined there uh, as, a, as, uh, as a working, uh, as an approved standard, sorry. So in particular, talking about the RESCONF draft, it is basically two, two sentences to adopt uh, as a should this, uh, these headers um, and one of the other point is because uh, in the NetConf draft, we adopted uh, versioning, and which is not part of the, uh, of the W3C implementation. We, we wanna make uh, you know, advantage of that. So a RESTConf uh, client can also uh, understand which versions of the headers are supported in the server by looking at the, at the, at the Yang library. Um, so what about next steps? Uh, and here again, we, we have the the icon issue. But uh, yeah, so basically we completed our to-do list for the NetConf uh, draft with the error handling. Uh, we published the RESTConf uh, sibling document uh, with the WCC headers. Another thing we've done, we, we worked with the WCC that, uh, you know, the, how, what was the process to submit um, the registration of the, they're keeping a list of all the different protocols that are implementing trace ID, uh, trace context uh, manipulation, uh, handling. And uh, there's a simple process uh, to do that. We, we already know how it is, but probably we'll need to, you know, get the chairman's uh, comment once, uh, hopefully the next steps happens, uh, which is regarding the working group adoption. We think uh, we are now in, in good shape for that and ready for uh, starting uh, some implementation experience and getting more feedback from the working group. The last point is not related to this draft, but it could be some future work. W3C is working on some, um, some draft also in their side headers that's called baggage that that could also be interested to adopt for RESTConf and NetConf. So just to remember at the end of the day, the end goal of this draft is when we have clients and servers talking either NetConf or RESTConf. So we're gonna have trace context uh, exchanged and that will allow the export of the data um, to, a, for example, using the OTLP or the Open Telemetry Protocol, which is the newest, uh, you know, cool thing to do for cloud-based application. And that will allow us in one, uh, as a monitoring element to have all the traces from different client and servers 
all connected with the same context, with the same trace ID. That's to give you an example of uh, pre-draft implementation we have working uh, in our side. So that's about it. Um, and uh, we do have that questions regarding uh, the working group uh, adoption that, uh, that we think we could uh, take to the, to the working group either here or in the mailing list. Sorry, we're preparing a, a show of hand polls. Both, I guess. Well, either side. Okay. okay. First, we'd like to get a poll for who's read these drafts. Okay, we have 44 people in the session and only 22 responses. It's a fairly <laughs> binary answer. And anonymous. I think it'd be fair to assume if somebody has read the draft, they've participated in the poll and say they have, and that you can assume that if they've not, they haven't. Okay, so it seemed like not too many people have read these drafts just yet. Do you think it's even appropriate to poll for adoption? Or? Okay, so maybe um, we should allow the working group a little more time to go at least read through the drafts before we call for adoption, which we can always do on the mailing list also. All right, thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, so I'm going to present the status of the configuration tracing draft. Uh, oh, I have control of the slides. Um, so the, the motivation to recall quickly is to understand uh, how to find, whenever we see that something is wrong with a configuration, let's say, on a network element, to be able to go through the hierarchies of controller and orchestrators and find out what is the, the, the original uh, query that uh, resulted in this configuration. Um, so that's the, the problem we're trying to solve here. And uh, so what we did is we aligned to what uh, Rokoe just uh, presented, which is the W3C uh, trace parent. So uh, before we had some, we were using the concept of uh, transaction ID, and now in this version, we're using the concept of trace, trace ID, which is the same along the way. So you see here the trace ID on the left is a tier one, and it's the same for the whole uh, configuration chain, let's say. And so we modeled this, uh, and to be a little bit complete, we modeled the W3C trace parent uh, in, uh, uh, in, in, in Young. And um, so this new version uh, simplifies uh, a lot, let's say, some of the issues that we had before, because now we don't have to match the transaction on the northbound side, let's say, of the controller to the transactions on the southbound side. They all have the same trace ID, so it's, uh, it's much simpler. And uh, basically, to place a little bit this work with respect to what Roque presented before, it's like the device view 
uh, let's say if we don't have the the the, tra the trace uh, recorded in the in the OLTP uh, uh, collector, it's the device view of the the same thing, and we can do that just by hopping from device to device. Um, so this is how we model the W3C transparent. So it's basically uh, just some uh, sequences of X digits with various length. Um, and the, this is the new version of the algorithm. So as I was saying, uh, as long as we uh, are able to get the a client ID uh, for a given trace ID, we can go back up the chain. So basically we start from the NE, we say, okay, I see that I have this change in the configuration. I'm able to match it to a trace ID and the client ID. Then I would go to the controller. Following the client ID, which will tell me which controller to go to. And then I will again try to match the trace ID. And if there is, again, the client ID, and then I can go to that client ID, which would be the orchestrator. And then maybe I reach the end, and I will have, the let's say, the local commit ID on the orchestrator, which means uh, I know what is the, for instance, service request that created the, the configuration. Um, so we still have uh, something a little bit unspecified in the draft. It's where to get the client ID. Um, the client ID is, uh, what is the client ID is out of scope for the draft. It's kind of the uh, inventory uh, issue and uh, each, uh, basically each uh, client which are orchestrator and controllers in a, in a network should have their own unique ID. Um, there is a question about um, whether we should do a more general solution that instead of presenting, let's say, the device view uh, that maps the local changes to a transaction, to a, to a trace ID, sorry, uh, should we actually take the, module, the, the, the same format as what is exported by uh, the the existing software that do the export of the trace and uh, and add what is missing, which which is, which would be the client ID and the local commit ID. So that's a possibility. I, I personally, I think the the mod, the model that we have is is uh, is, is simpler. And uh, there are some questions that uh, that were closed. So basically, resconf is solved because no. Uh, we have the draft that uh, Roque just presented and uh, the collision between the southbound IDs, uh, it's solved because now we have a trace ID and it should be unique. So, yeah, basically this is, uh, this is all for me. So are there any, any questions? No question, the chairs are preparing a show of hand poll. Okay, same as last poll. Have you read the draft? Okay, that's probably good enough. Um, the same results as the last poll, actually, which was um, you know about uh, you know nine or so 
saying that they've read, um, about 20 saying they haven't read, and another 20 that didn't uh, vote at all. Um, and it makes me wonder, I, it's probably the same group of people that are read both the last and this, and uh, okay. but or, or, and, or not read, right? And so the general um, interest level, I mean, I, I, I do believe the working group has interest in this work and in, in tracing, right? Both the, the previous and, and this are about tracing. I do believe there's general interest, but um, the results aren't really indicating that. So um, maybe they need more time. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, and that might just get more people to comment on the draft itself. Uh, so Rob Wilson says, I'm sorry, I've not had a chance to read the draft. I do think it's an interesting problem. The one question I have in my head is what level of complexity is this adding onto the server? So that's the thing I want to understand in terms of what the actual implementation impact would be to do this. And is that worth the cost of doing this? So, I, I, you know, also are there alternative solutions that reduce that complexity? So that's the thing I don't know because I haven't read the draft. So, um, so basically, uh, we would still, uh, let's say, the implementation that uh, Jan is doing, uh, or Jan and Roque are doing for the for the netconf um, uh, trace parent trace context headers. Uh, so we would it would be the same complexity as that. Uh, the only thing is then uh, we need to populate this uh, these fields from the. Uh, on the server, when you receive the, the let's say, the, the headers, you need to populate the, the, the young module uh, based on these headers and the, whatever local system you use to track your uh, your configuration changes. So that's I think that's not a huge implementation effort on the on the server side. Benoit Claes. So. Uh... There are four different uh, documents on Transfer ID. At the last ITF, uh, Jan Lingblad did the, what I thought was a good presentation to give the overview of the four different drafts mm -hmm. and how they were complementary. Jean, in the last session, was saying a couple of sentences like, well, this is the view of Roque, but from the device. And this one is solved because it's solved by the Roque's draft. So maybe if we want to get this well understood by everybody, it might be beneficial to redo this and say, we have four different pieces and they work together. So on the ad adoption call, for me, it's not just one tiny solution. It's like all of these together. So that's something that the, the author discussed uh, privately and maybe that's a thing to do. I agree. Sounds helpful to me. Jan? Very good. Actually, I asked the uh, chairs if I should make such an overview here as well, but they didn't come back on that. So I, did, I didn't want to repeat myself. Uh, anyway, I think when it comes to the implementation uh, effort, I think one important aspect is how much reuse there is uh, in existing technology. And this one, the proposed solution here is de uh, depending on the W3C, the web consortium's definitions. So there's already a lot of tools out there that use these headers. So I think it, from that standpoint, this is a very inexpensive solution. It's already reusing a lot of the out open source and commercial tools out there. So Rob Wilson, Cisco, I think it was, I think it was more thinking in terms of not in terms of what code and libraries already exist there, but the actual what extra state is being stored. And again, I just don't have a feel for what the solution looks like. Is, is this being state stored in a separate table? Is this that you annotate extra metadata through your YAN configuration tree? And if so, how much metadata is that? Uh, and again, you have different views on how costly that metadata is depending on whether you can share it efficiently or not. So that was the questions I had. And I, I, it comes down to I don't understand. Uh, I haven't read the draft, don't understand what the solution is, and then I'll have a better judgment. Let me quickly comment. I'll say that compared to all the rest of the configuration and the things that are happening, this is very lightweight. So I think Benoit had a, a proposal for um, the overview um, 
to be presented again so the working group can understand how they all fit together. And also, I think there's a proposal to uh, adopt them all together so as, as a joint adoption, which I agree with as well. Yeah, I would agree that I think having that overview again be presented in the next uh, ITF would enable, uh, I think, people here to not only understand, but the adoption process. Well, maybe not even the next ITF. I, I'm not sure if we're uh, prepared for it uh, right now, but if the slides are the same as from last meeting, then maybe we could bring them up again. Is, would that be possible, Jan? Yeah, I can bring up the same slides again. Of course I can, if you want. Okay, so how about we move to the last presentation and then the chairs can reload the slides from the previous ITF. We do have time in the schedule to do this, so. Okay. Hi there. Um, so James Cumming talking on behalf of the authors, myself and Rob Wills from Cisco. Um, just wanted to do a couple of things. Uh, firstly, recap the NetConf private candidate solution. So next slide. Um, give a quick reminder of what it is. Uh, so the idea here being that uh, every session can have its own candidate configuration um, for both NMDA and non-NMDA capable servers. Um, and, and maybe that's an open question for the working group later. Um, uh, you can store and stage all of your changes, do multiple edit configs, and then perform all the usual operations on your candidate, um, completely independently from another session's candidate. Uh, and the document describes uh, how to do that um, on NetConf. And in the 02 version, we've added uh, RESTConf as well. Um, following some feedback from the working group. Um, it also details what is a conflict um, when you make uh, commit changes or update changes between the different uh, candidates, whether it's the, the shared candidate or the running configuration, um, and how you can resolve those conflicts as well um, within the system. So next slide, please. Um, just graphically to kind of explain this, uh, it's probably a bit easier in some respects. Um, we have our running configuration in the middle um, and a number of private candidates shown. So in, in a kind of timeline way, left to right, uh, your first session creates a private candidate, does an edit config, and then does a commit. And it uh, kind of treats it like a source code type approach, um, basically merges it back into the running configuration um, and then performs an automatic update at that point. So commit triggers an update. Um, which means that your private candidate is now back in sync with the running candidate, the running configuration, but it does not close that private candidate. Um, it would close it when you when you close down your session. So you can carry on making more con uh, edit configs and do a commit again and so on. Uh, in the meantime, you'll notice down the bottom that private candidate two was opened. Um, it is baselined against the running configuration at the time it opens it. Um, it can do its own edit configs completely separately from private candidates one. Um, you'll notice there's an update here. Um, the draft specifies two methods, uh, um, an automatic update method. Um, so it's called continuous rebase mode or a manual rebase mode. Um, so basically this could be uh, either the system or the user uh, inputting an update and saying, right, go resync back in with the, uh, the running configuration. Or depending on the server's implementation, um, which we uh, we detail how to signal that in the draft as well, um, it could be that at this point that uh, private candidate one commits to the running, the running automatically updates all private candidates. So that's the continuous rebase mode. So now your private candidate two is synced with running and you can are making your edit changes okay. here, but they discard it at the end. So, um, And then the sessions are destroyed when you close that session down or we lose your connectivity. So just from a kind of graphical perspective, it's a bit easier to explain it using that. So next slide. Thank you. Um, so in 02, we've added uh, RESTConf, uh, as we mentioned. 
Um, this works pretty similarly to the shared candidate, um, which is also very similar to the non-NMDA approach. So basically, once your um, session is uh, in private candidates, it's, it's private candidates for, for the duration. Um, we spent some time defining the semantics of compare and how to extend the compare operation. Um, and we added uh, a reference point parameter that I'll talk about on the next slide as well um, for that one. Uh, and then we'd mentioned that you should signal um, what resolution methods you have and what you use um, and that you're using private candidates, but we didn't mention in detail how. Um, so we've done that now as well in the draft. So next slide. Next slide. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, so this one in the... Uh, the PowerPoint version is slightly animated, so it makes a bit more sense. So we'll um, we'll go go with the red version. So th there's um, as we build it up, there's there's various points. So you've got your yellow creation point. Um, so this is all about compare. Your yellow creation point is the point your private candidate is created. So your your branch is started. Um, we have the the red now point um, where you are in time at this moment in time, and then the last update point which is the U. Um, so compare would work in that you compare your private candidate data store with one of the other data stores. So by default, it would be compare my private candidate with the running, for example. Um, so that's red to red down here. Um, it's also beneficial, particularly given that there are two methods, the automatic rebase and the manual rebase, um, to be able to compare your own private candidate now with where it was at the last update piece. So we added an extension, a reference point extension to the um, compare um, operation as well. So the draft proposes changing that. Um, uh, and likewise, also from where you are within your private candidate to the creation point of your private candidate. And these two could be different because as you see this update point, last update point moves with updates. And if that's manual, that's quite obvious, but if you're in the continuous rebase mode, maybe that move is less obvious as to the fact that it's actually happened. Um, so that's why the last update and the creation point ones are, are both there. Um, so that's the extensions we're proposing to compare. I think uh, there's one more slide, I think. There is. Oh, sorry. Um, so this is uh, the th third time of presenting this, I think, and the third iteration. So and we've had some, some feedback, um, but we'd like to look at the working group adopting the work. Um, we did a show of hands a while back where people said it was beneficial work and we, we should do it. Um, and we'd also like to ask for some kind of specific uh, attention from the working group on the conflict resolution and detection piece, because that we think is kind of vital to get right. Um, I think we're we're pretty close um, for that piece. Um, one thing we did come across when we were looking at um, this, in particularly the non-NMDA approach, uh, where we send a client capability to signal that we're in private candidate mode, is none of the drafts that we could find, and maybe we missed them, um, detail how you deal with a secondary hello being sent. Um, and we've we've seen in kind of in the industry there's multiple different uh, inconsistent implementations across the board on on how this happens. So, for example, if you send the private candidate capability hello, or oh, well, sorry, you send a hello without the private candidate capability, and then subsequently you send one with a, another hello with a private candidate capability, should we uh, ignore it, close the session, uh, or somehow elevate ourselves to? A private candidate. Um, so this just came up as uh, kind of one of the discussion points. We'd noticed there was some some inconsistency, and, and uh, the drafts weren't specific. Um, so whether it's dealt with as part of this, or whether we should deal with it just subsequently as a working group, that we should be specific. What you do with a another hello that uh, maybe conflicts? Uh, we should probably clarify that anyway. Separately. And I think that's it. Okay. So, yep, as a contributor, uh, I think the reason why we don't have much discussion about how do we deal with conflicts if there's multiple hellos is because there isn't support for multiple hellos. The hello is only supposed, supposed to happen at the beginning of the neckoff. 
I, yes, absolutely, it's supposed to happen, but none of the drafts say that specifically, that it should be happening only at the beginning, and, and if you send another one, it should be ignored or dropped, or um, <laughs> okay. they, they just kind of don't mention it. All right, that's um, interesting. I agree. I think the intent is that there's only the one at the beginning, but it's, yes. it, that it wasn't as stated as a problem. Probably. Yeah, no, I, I think that's, <laughs> but, that's my belief as well, but yeah, we found some con inconsistent mm -hmm implementations across the industry so right right not clear. but but also taking a step back um when netconf was first defined it was prior to restconf being defined and since then i think we've moved as a working group away from the idea of doing the capabilities exchange in the hello mm -hmm. more towards the uh, yang library and and specifically that there can be yang library notifications uh that can alert clients to the fact that new capabilities have been um made available and uh, so the problem still exists that yes. where, where the, possibly the capability wasn't existing initially and then it becomes a, a, available later. Yeah. So. Yeah, and, and it's actually visible even in the kind of base capability. Um, so if you start with base 1.0 and then you send base 1.1, what do you do? And, and there's, there's definitely some complete inconsistencies there. Um, Sorry. Uh, okay, go ahead. But, but then just considering Kent, I think the protocol capabilities are not included in ITF Yang library. So this case is outside that. Maybe we should put them or they're in the netconf monitoring, which doesn't have a notification. Yeah, but this is a new problem. And, and it may be a, an entirely separate problem from the private candidates. It's just something we noticed that was very, uh, unclear in all of the, the previous work that's gone before us. Um, so we should tighten it up properly, separately. I can't find my hand tool to put it in the queue. Um, I have. Yeah, sure. Okay, thank first. Okay, thank first. Yes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't hit the queue button, Rob. <laughs> Can you go back to the previous slide? Yeah, I just noticed that the private candidate is destroyed on the session close, right? Correct. Yeah, but why just destroy it uh, when a commit operation is finished? Be why doesn't it destroy yeah, it? Yeah, so that you don't have to update the can private candidate uh, if next time you want to edit it. Um, because your session might still be open and you might still be wanting to do additional edits to it. Um, so you have two options. You could, we could, um, destroy it and immediately recreate it. Um, but that seems kind of more work. If we already have it open, it's, it, it is up to date. Um, and the reason that we didn't do that was also because the update mechanism has a default and that default could be changed on a particular server implementation. And when that automatic update happens, it could follow the resolution rules as well. Um, so there would be some consistency between when I always run an update, whether it's manual or automatic, it always has the, the resolution rules that I've decided for my implementation. Um, and there's three, three options given for how you deal with those resolutions. So that's the reason we did it. Um, but you're right, and an alternative could be to completely destroy it every time and then recreate it. Yeah, recreate it. If next time you still want to add a config towards that. Yeah, absolutely. And that would be the same as closing your session and reconnecting with a new session. It would be exactly the same behavior there. Okay. So will a client have an, some other extra implementation complexity to support this private candidate? I think no. Right? Um, no. To, we've specified uh, ways of doing it for NMDA-capable and non-NMDA-capable servers. So in a NMDA-capable server, the client needs to know, do nothing different. Um, we would address the private candidate as a new private candidate configuration data store, same as any others. Um, so there's updates on the server side um, from a, and from a data that you might send from the client, but the client specifically doesn't need code changes. Um, on the uh, non-NMDA capable one, the client is required to send a client capability, but um, pretty much all of the clients out there do that today so um there's either no or very minimal code changes required for clients um, certainly we have implementations of that piece already from a client side okay so my last question do you allow the private candidate that store 
to be coexist with the shared candidate desktop? Sorry, do we allow the private candidate to be the shared candidate? To be coexist with oh. the shared candidate? Uh, yes, we are not restricting that from happening. Now, an implementation may choose to restrict that from happening, but in the draft, we're not restricting those two things. Okay, um, but uh, if you already have the private candidate, why does the client write it to the private candidate? Why should we require a shared candidate? Um, we don't require a, a shared candidate. So an individual session will choose whether it wants to edit a shared candidate or a private candidate as part of that either capability exchange at the beginning or as part of targeting the relevant data store in the operation. So the client makes a choice, I, I want to work in a private candidate or I want to work in the shared candidate and different clients may choose to work in different ways. Um, so you may have a, a one client over here editing a private candidate, <laughs> The other client here is still using the traditional shared candidate model. And there's, there should be nothing from a, uh, in, in our opinion, from a draft perspective that precludes those two things from happening. Now, it's, it's fair that they make the implementations may choose to, you know, lock one over the other or only allow one at a time or however. Um, but I think that's an implementation specific thing that we didn't want to mandate. Okay. So is there any, I think the, a uh, backward compatible consideration because I thought the legacy client might do not understand the private candidate and is still trying to write it to the shared candidate so that the server might still maintain a shared candidate for that legacy clients. Yeah, no, there should be no backwards compatibility issues because in the NMDA way, you're specifically targeting a private candidate configuration data store. And in the non-NDA way, you turn your session into a private candidate session at the beginning of the session, and it remains for the duration of that session. Um, and actually, it's one of the reasons that, that the support is immediately there for 99% you know, of clients is because in that non-NDA way, you target candidate like you did before. It just it happens to be the, the private candidate rather than the shared candidate. OK, thank you. No problem. Uh, Robert, uh, on the next slide, just a minor comment on the hello handling to just to say that there's the netconf issue tracker. And so I would suggest trying to decouple the hello issue from this draft. Yep. Uh, raise, please raise an issue there to track it. Uh, have the conversation on the list to try and see if we get a resolution to what that should be. Uh, I'm not sure we can fix it now, but it'd be good to at least have the discussion and have it documented. So that'd be great. But don't I wouldn't type this to that. Right, Kent is a contributor. Um, I am looking at the Yang library. You're just correct; it's doesn't doing the, it's not doing protocol capabilities exchange. But I'm now looking at uh, eighty forty and how it handles it. I think it's in the uh, monitoring state monitoring um, module. So maybe we need. To, I, I agree, we can't solve it now, but we should track it and yeah, look for a I, way I to track it. I think the two are decoupled. It's just it was um, it was relevant when we were trying to work out how the non NVA capable one should work. Um, uh, we had some some people who thought that yeah, you should be able to send another capability and elevate it. And, and some you, people who thought that maybe that shouldn't be the case. Also, um, in response to Shafang's question, I think you said that it might be possible for an implementation to disable the shared candidate. I, I don't know how that could be done. Uh, no, I said it might be possible for an implementation to say that you should be using one at a time, like either private candidates or shared candidates by, say, locking, for example. Um, but we are not mandating anything to do with that at all. We're not saying that it should be the case. We're not saying that should happen. Um, it's, that's an entirely separate implementation thing that we wouldn't, we wouldn't do, probably. Right. Well, I guess my, my observation is that currently the shared candidate is the default. It's implicit. Absolutely. There's no way to uh, indicate that it's active. Um, and so, the presumption is that it is always active with but, these yes, protocols. But it can be locked. So an implementation could lock it, for okay. example. Um, okay. So just echoing sort of Kent's concern there, I, I think actually maybe in the capability exchange that you do, maybe it's worth having a capability to make it clear whether you can do both or not or something like that. I don't know if that's an option. Yeah, I mean, if the working group feels that that is a concern and we should specify uh, our view was that we would leave it um, as it is today, not, not change the behavior for shared candidate whatsoever. 
private candidate justification. Um, and uh, if, if a particular implementation wants to do something that, that restricts the use of uh, these approaches, then that would be up to them. But I don't think that's something we should put in a draft, to be honest. Well, I guess what I was thinking of is maybe you just say to all clients, actually, we're going to move forward with a private candidate. That's what everyone's going to get. And actually, that's the best behavior anyway. So we don't support the shared candidate going forward. Is there a way of communicating that to a client so it knows? It's the thing I was, was wanting to get to, really. Sure. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, on a per session basis, the non NDA one, I mean, it doesn't stop it. In that session, it would essentially stop using shared candidate anyway because whenever you say candidate, it means private candidate. Um, because the capability flags yeah, exactly. that, you're, that you're specifying as a client. As a client, you say, hey, I'm going to use private candidates. And this is what gives you that kind of backwards compatibility for all the implementations that are out there right now. Um, and then when you reference um, candidate, it means a private candidate. So you sort of have that, although not explicitly as you mean, um, in the non NMDA capable approach. And so in that case, if uh, if you try to connect without the client specifying the private candidate flag, and naturally it would get the shared candidate, Absolutely. maybe having an error message to say this isn't supported, maybe that's already covered, but effectively having a way to communicate that you, you, the service is not going to support that. Yeah, I, I don't know that this draft would be the right place for writing something that says that NetConf implementations can disable shared candidates entirely. Maybe uh, seems. I think Kate. I think candidates an optional functionality. I don't think it's required that you implement it. Candidate is yes, indeed. Yeah. And at, but what we have said is that to use private candidates, you must advertise the candidate capability and the private candidate capability. So maybe that is the bit that we would want to rework or need to rework if that were the case, and we were to say, hey, you could disable shared candidates entirely. Just worth thinking about. Sure. Yeah, that's definitely a good discussion point, and certainly something we should. As a working group, talk about a bit more at length. Can you bend the microphone? Uh, did you encounter Olga Havel, Huawei participant? Uh, I'm just wondering, have you encountered any uh, scenarios, use cases where you may have to keep the candidate between the sessions? Like, if there is a backup scenario, resiliency, or you know, some problems with the session, and you have to reconnect and things like that. So the shared candidate will, in in many implementations, do that. Um, uh, the private candidates, we had explicitly said that we wanted to destroy any changes, discard any changes when the session closed. Um, so we haven't looked at a persistent candidate as part of this work currently. Um, I mean, if it's if we feel as a group that it's something we we should look at, then then we, we can, but our feeling was that it was not something that we we needed to target. Okay, so I believe the chairs have prepared some show, show of hand poll. Again, if you've read the draft, Okay, the numbers are still coming in, but it's fairly split. Um, oop, changing a little bit. I think it's fair to say those who haven't uh, raised their hand at all uh, haven't read the draft. But I'm a little bit concerned about uh, this poll, uh, the, the reading of the draft polls, uh, not having uh, much uh, participation. Uh, and yet I think I hear a lot of interest in the working group. And I'm afraid that we're going to get into a situation where we're not moving forward. And so I'd like to move anyway to next uh, show of hand poll of uh, 
you know, do we uh, think we should, do we think this draft is a good basis for um, moving forward or for the working group adoption? Of course, we can adjust the details as we, after adoption. So we'll prepare that poll. And I think you also had some other questions that you wanted to have polls on in your last slide. And the last slide. Um, no, they weren't so much um, specific questions, more of uh, an ask for people when they when they do read um, the draft the next time round, or, or those who haven't read it to uh, focus their attention on. Um, it's really the, the very specific areas that form the basis of this draft that are vital we get right, um, particularly around what is a conflict and how do you resolve it. Okay, good, thank you. While the results are coming in, it's so far unanimous that um, people believe this is, well, okay, I spoke too soon, <laughs> almost unanimous <laughs> that people think that this is a good basis for uh, adoption. And this is what I thought. I, I do perceive a lot of interest in the working group. Um, maybe the question of if you've read this draft is like too specific, um, but the general interest is there. And I, I also believe the sentiment is for the previous drafts with tracing and, and, the, um, and the transaction ID. So that's why I, I want to do this. So the normal question I ask when I see a lot of support for this, there's two people raising concerns. Uh, if you bring your question to the mic or on the list, that would be really helpful to understand why you don't think this is a good basis because it's good to see what the dissenting views are. Oh. So <clears throat> I think the most difficult question on this draft is not capabilities that we'll solve, but how to merge, how to notify the user of a private candidate that up an update happened. I see those as the most risky ones. Yeah. Uh, and actually, the, in the uh, manual rebase mode, that's that's less of an issue. The auto rebase mode, absolutely, that's, that's uh, an issue. And then, so assuming that you have won, people who voted against, maybe you didn't, I don't know. So can I ask a different question? Say, is, do you think the working group should be working on this, as in adopting a document on this to get the work going, is that something you would be okay with? Or do you have still have objections to think more work needs to happen before it gets adopted? I would like to see more work on the merge and, and the rebase notifications before we adopt it, actually. The problem is interesting, but yeah, I see that as a risky that we can solve this properly. So there's a notification section that you feel is missing, will that? Okay, that's good feedback. Yes, that's that would be one. And so I'm thinking about you have an operator, of, let's say, or an expert that knows one part of the big configuration. Mm -hmm. Will he be able to understand that, okay, someone else is working on another part, and but that is a distinct part, and I don't have problems, and I don't have, I don't know, cross-references? Yeah, I and mean, then actually the system will tell you that. Um, so the, the system is designed to, or the, the draft is designed on the basis that a conflict is where you're touching things that are um, e either identically the same things you're touching or referenced by the same things you're touching. So if you're editing, um, I don't know, the, the user list, for example, and someone else is editing a BGP root policy, uh, and you both commit, those two things are not in conflict, and the system would not raise a conflict and say you need to resolve this. However, if you were both editing the same policy, for example, and you tried to commit it, the system would stop and say, there is a, there is a collision here and you need to update. And then you have your update resolution methods available to you as to how to choose to resolve that situation. I am a bit still worried because if you are editing the same data nodes, then yes, that could be clear. Complicated, but clear. But if you have references, let's say in a must statement, maybe a two-step reference. I reference, we both reference something common that can be tricky. Sure.
And I would say that I think the poll can it kind of indicates that I think there is lack of understanding or maybe um, not enough show of hands to say that they agree with the what the uh, conflict resolution and it should be like. Um, so maybe that's a question we should retake. I uh, take it to the uh, mailing list with some explanation. Sure. I'm not sure that question specifically there but yeah yes i mean there's some work to do on the notification piece that, that's that's some good feedback absolutely um yeah i don't know that there's a question on the resolution well a, a couple folks uh, did not raise a hand or do not agree with the way that the conflict resolution is proposed would either of them like to describe or explain why they oh, this was a different poll. sorry i've missed that Hi, this is Severin from Austin University. I just like question this polls, to be honest, because first, the first poll was about how many people read this draft, and we had found out that at least 15 people haven't read it, and like 10 people have read it, or maybe 12. And then in the second poll, you ask about, do you agree or not? And then like 21 people agree with it, but a lot of them haven't read the draft. So I really question these polls. Because how do you want to agree with it if you haven't read it? So I don't, I don't know, maybe <clears throat> this is how the IT works, but it probably makes more sense to give this to the mailing list and discuss it there. Everything is uh, revalidated on the mailing list anyway. I think the, the folks that were um, agreeing with the sentiment of the draft were doing so primarily from history of having, uh, you know, been participating in these presentations and the general sense of, you know, they, they support the solution, but the, did they really re read this specific draft? Maybe they didn't. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So it sounded like you had a couple um, very specific uh, comments that you could update the draft Absolutely. first, and then um, we can bring it to the list and then hopefully do adoption on the list. Oh, sure. Right. And now we have a, uh, we're gonna go back to the overview of tracing mechanisms slides. Thank you. Um, I would say on the tracing mechanisms one, this formed part of that original one. Um, but I think over time, I think we've seen it, it maybe isn't an exact part of the same set. So if we're considering adopting them all together, maybe uh, the private candidates one should step out of that. <laughs> That's a good point. I was thinking that, that as well, because the um, transaction ID, right? So, you know, it, if it's conflict or not conflict, the mechanism for detecting the conflict is through the transaction ID. Uh, it's not currently actually. Right, but, um, but it could be. It could be. Yeah. Um, yeah, but then that requires, that would require changes to both clients and servers to be supportive that mm -hmm. actually today would just work. Okay. All right, so Jan, thank you for stepping into the queue. I've made pass slide control to you. Okay, thanks. Let's see if I can quickly go here. Uh, so just to give you a brief background on what this tracing and IDs about transactions and traces are all about. So here's a picture of a, a hierarchical orchestration system with controllers and network elements. And this is showing how uh, an order from a BFS system is tagged with, in this case, order 4711, and how that trickles down to all the elements and controllers that are involved in this. So that when there are log messages or metrics or KPIs of any sort, those are also tagged with this thing so that the, the melt system, which is usually called, that's collecting all of this data can correlate all the messages from different uh, sources. And th this one is saying order 4711, meaning it's a sort of a transaction, but this could just as well be an RPC or even a, a notification that's coming out of one of these controllers and network elements saying that, hey, something happened with something that corresponds to, or has, has something to do with, with order 4711 or whichever RPC or something that happened earlier that part of it. So the, the thing is to get an ID that uh, is reusable uh, and in the collector. And uh, the way to do that is uh, those um, IDs have to have some sort of format and the, the World Wide Web Consortium has already defined an ID uh, 
format for this. So we thought that we would just reuse the trace parent and trace state for this. That's defined in those in the spec that you see on the page there. Uh, it's very lightweight in the sense, I mean, it's just uh, a single header here in the rest conf case. And we provided a net conf uh, uh, XML mapping for that as well, which is basically just put a namespace in front of it and have the same thing again to be able to trace this data. So it's not very um, innovative in that sense, but it is very useful in, this, in, the, in the sense that there are already tools that are using these headers and these formats, both open source and commercial. So it's well worth reusing that functionality so that we don't have to write our own melt consumers. And if we move down a little bit further, let's see if I can find the right slide when it comes to these, I think slide how 14. these drafts. Yeah, here it is. So here was the list of drafts that we had uh, in the 116 meeting. And now there's one more uh, for the headers. So basically the W3C trace, there has one more WC3 dash headers. That's also adding some, basically just two sentences, as Rocky said, pointing to the World of Web Consortium. So for RESTConf, we are reusing the World of Web Consortium uh, documents straight off. And for NetConf, we had to add an XML mapping, but that is not needed for RESTConf really. Uh, and then, then why we in, uh, involved uh, the, pri the private candidates in this whole solution for a bit was that if you look at this use case map, mm -hmm. there were some little overlaps here and there with the PrivCan column. And this, the two maybes here uh, have now in the, the most recent version, uh, in my opinion, changes to overlap. So they are, there are three areas where there are some overlap. And so there are some touch points, but I agree uh, with uh, James that it's not very strong. I mean, they can be developed independently, but there are some things that are, have some overlap here. And uh, the way I described it in the last meeting was that, okay, let's say we have this, we have orchestrators, we have controllers, we have network elements. And the first thing we are adding to the puzzle here is this private candidates. Uh, that's a functionality that controllers may use. And there are some functional, I mean, some overlap in this tracing uh, for that. Uh, then we have the transaction IDs, which are important to see how the configuration is trickling down and much of the work of the device or a controller has to do with configuration. So I think it's kind of important to trace that separately, but the trace IDs will also flow into these transaction IDs. So the transaction IDs uh, are good for many use cases, but they will also need to be mapped to the trace IDs. Uh, in the first version of the transaction ID uh, documents, that contained a, me a mechanism for in for combining transaction IDs with trace IDs, but that was not uh, so much liked. So we separated that out, and now it's a separate. And we found this World of Web Consortium specification that's doing exactly that. So that's how that maps into transaction IDs. There's a, a link between them, and then we have this uh, the the trace the trace mechanism that Rocky talked about. Uh, with the headers and the, how these messages are going to the melt processor and how the mapping is done there. It, it's very, very thin because we are depending completely on the Web Web Consortium specs there for that. And then finally, we have the piece uh, where we can have Yang interface to this that um, uh, Jean talked about uh, is providing a way for a, a different, if you don't want to use this, uh, the OTLP mechanism for shooting data to the melt processor, you can use Yang and the normal Yang mechanism to get the same information. So it's really uh, different angles of the same problem and they fit very well together, I would say. The, there are some overlaps between the use cases, but it is because they are providing different functionalities for it. So I think at least this, uh, the trace mechanism that we talk about, the green and the gray here, they should be treated together. They have strong connections with transaction ID and some, some touch points with the PrivCAN. I don't know if that gave you any, uh, I already presented this last time over. Uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to comment or answer. So just a 
clarify, you said you felt that the green and the gray should be combined into a single effort? Yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, they are progressing together. The gray one is referencing the green one. So as it is right now, uh, the gray one cannot proceed unless the green one does too. Uh, I think they are talking about the same concepts uh, and they are working to the same spirit. They're providing slightly different functionality for the, for the end solution. So I think they, it makes sense to work with them together. And the, the green one is now two different drafts. So it's the green one and the other green one and the gray one that should be treated together. I think that makes sense. And of course the yellow one is already adopted. Uh, so it does not need to be adopted the same time as green and gray, but it also has a strong connections to this. So I think it makes sense to think about it in the same context. Right, strong connections, but, um, and as you rate, mostly complementary. Um, but these would remain as separate drafts. I, like a server could support just private candidate, for instance, and not the others, or likewise uh, only support transaction ID and not the others. Yes, I think that's what I said last time. Let's see if you can find that slide. So uh, my proposal at that time in the 160 meeting was to create a framework of four separate documents or now five of them, and where each one would be optional to implement and optional to use for clients. So they, they would stand alone uh, when, when using them or when implementing them, but they form a whole together. For example, use cases and terminology and behavior should be aligned. Okay, can you go back to the previous slide, the matrix or with the green and the gray or listen, there you go. Uh, or maybe the previous one from that. But um, so before we had asked if the members had read the draft and the results were tepid. The, um, and yet we did that on the last one with a private candidate. And then we asked, do we think it's a good basis for um, adoption? Mm -hmm. <laughs> which was a, t a rough thing to do because uh, as was pointed out, um, how can you feel like there's a good basis when you haven't read it? But I, I feel like the same is true here, again, where this work has been going on for some time, there's obviously interest in the working group and yet we're not able to get the ball over the line, so to speak. Um, so I think I'd like to, or maybe we should do the poll again for if we think that this, uh, set of drafts as a basis for something the working group should try to move forward and adopting the other two remaining or, or the other drafts that are currently um, individual drafts. So one other thing I could uh, I was thinking of proposing is that uh, the four drafts be combined together in a design team and that a common team be formed so that the four draft authors can work together maybe? Would that help? I think more or less we are doing that already. Okay. At least, I mean, we are syncing between meetings and discussing and sharing ideas. So. And so, Rob, I was just going to say, uh, yes, if you do that, already great. But it sounds like some of these drafts can still act quite independently, like the private candidate store. So that one seems to be sort of tangentially related rather than directly related. Is that fair, Jan? For, for, the, for the private candidate, I think so, yes. And then just to go on another clarifying question, you said about treating the green and the gray and the gray, the green and the green and the gray together. Do you mean that, that they should either all be adopted as a set or they should be considered as a set that they're all sort of solved in the same, same space? So I think one of the questions was, are we trying to adopt, we already adopted one of them, five drafts together, or are we trying to adopt a subset of those drafts? That's the bit that's not clear to me. I'm not uh, the political expert here, but I think it at least makes sense to to uh, adopt them together, the, the green and the green and the gray. But if uh, if that slows things down, uh, then we can do that individu individually as well. And and then on that, so it wasn't clear to me whether the Yang TXID mapping and the melt processor stuff, if those are uh, complementary or somewhat two different solutions to the same problem. It's NetConf and RESTConf. Okay. Okay. Uh, so Rob, while uh, you still at the mic, so one of the drafts is an ops area draft. Would that then, I guess, be moved here for adoption? It, well, it sounds like they should all be, if they're related in any way, shape or form, I think they should all be here. Because I think 
definitely the uh, the first two, are obviously, one's already been adopted, and, and this is the right place for private camp based. So I think all of this work should be done here. Good question. Okay, I note to the author then. Okay, so the unanimous so far, maybe nearly unanimous in a moment, but um, this is what I suspected that uh, the working group does wish to move forward with this uh, this work, the suite of drafts to adopt it as working group documents. Um, and the, the details of whether or not this most recent draft was read, uh, maybe was getting in the way. And we will rerun these uh, adoption polls on the list. Um, and, but I suspect that we'll be successful at that time. Thank you, Jan, for uh, going over the, the overview slides again. Sorry to make you repeat yourself. <laughs> <laughs> if you want me to, not a problem. Thank you. All right, so we still have uh, oh, on the queue. Did you want to say something? All right. Um, if there are no other questions or comments, this then ends the net concession for ITF 170. Thank you. Oh, do we have? Yeah. Go ahead. It's net conf open mic time. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I did not make it uh, to the cutoff date. I just published a draft to implement the Yankov structure in a young module to develop it in young push, uh, but using encoding as uh, encodings such as uh, JSON and Seabor. Uh, I would like to request more feedback on this draft, and I would love also uh, to trigger the discussions on uh, if the seat range uh, for CBOR should be managed by the working group, should be managed by core, what are the guidelines on, on that aspect? Uh, because today there is not guidelines, so yeah. So I'm trying to remember the seat range. I think what was going to happen was that um, Ayana, who, who manages all the registries and things, was going to get allocated a mega block, if that's the right term, a million SID IDs for ITF. And then I was I was thinking, as any working group in the ITF publishes uh, any Yang modules, that they would then get allocated a subset of that block for that Yang module. So I think it'd be managed by Ayana, effectively, that's that part of the process. I don't think we would be resourceful managing here. Does that answer your question? So, um, kind of, but that means also that we should ask them in through the drafts, or do you think that they should be generated directly on Jana? H how are the standardization part uh, would work in a way? So I need to take that one. So I need to reread the because the SID draft is it's been to the ISG. I I sent it back again. Um, so it's back in core. It's, the core already happened and discussed it this week. Could you send an email? Have a look at the SID draft and send an email to the core list and, and raise that question in terms of the process question. And copy me in, actually, pretty handy. The process question of how um, the SIDs get, uh, get assigned. My understanding was during development, you can sort of redo the SIDs and things like that. But I would have thought that the point that gets standardized comes an RFC. SIDs would be allocated, but I don't know if it specifies that and puts the burden on the authors to do that, or, or if there's some process in the machinery, like the IANA machinery as, the, as, it, as it gets adopted, it'd be done. 
but I know that we do have some sort of tooling in Yang, uh, excuse me, in Yang catalog to actually uh, allocate some of these. So it's not like a, a large manual step that people have to do. So hopefully we can do it automatically. Yeah, I will send out an email to the core one key group and talk through that. I was going to have the same comment that, you know, any question about SIDS really, uh, it should be taken to the core working group. It's not an account working group item. Any more open mic items? <laughs> we got 10 more minutes. All right. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Um, and, and see you in Prague. Yep. And thank you to Per, our secretary, for uh, helping to take meeting minutes and, and others. I think Chiffon was taking some minutes as well, right? So thank you. Unplug me. Yeah. Yes. So James came by to ask process question on Anna application for capabilities. And that should trigger just to pick it up when we send the blood. Yeah. It does sound like we need to figure out that. Okay, there's two things that concerns me. 